Welcome, everyone, uh, on the session, the breakout session on circular cities. Um, my name is Ana Baptista, and I'll be moderating this uh, amazing panel, uh, an all-female panel. I love it. <laughs> so you know it's going to be a powerful session. Um, so I'm not going to do long introductions. I'm just going to uh, refer you all to the bios that are posted online for all of our speakers so you can get a really in-depth uh, sense of who each of our speakers are and uh, so we have more time for discussion. So I'm going to bring up first uh, Claire Mifflin from Woven um, and she's going to talk to us about circular systems. Hello, everybody. Yeah, we're going to start at the system level and get a little... Um, from large scale to small scale as we go through the speakers. So I'm going to be talking about um, developing re resilient and circular systems um, through biomimicry, which is the process of learning from nature. And um, I used this process when I was developing the zero waste design guidelines for the AIA in New York. At the same time, I was also doing a master's and professional certification in biomimicry, which really influenced my thinking and thinking of our material systems as analogous to ecosystems. So biomimicry, many people know it as learning from nature's forms, like we could learn from the barrel cactus that, that grows in really arid environments, and its form allows it to expand and store water, and it self-shades itself with its pleats and the needles, and so that would be kind of, we could mimic its form. But we can also look at process. And that in the center is um, horseshoe, cra horseshoe, sorry, hermit crabs. And there's a great video that with, um, online you can find with David Attenborough narrating how the hermit crabs find new shells. So if there's a little hermit crab, it needs a bigger shell, it's in a little shell, finds this big empty shell on the beach. What does it do? It doesn't look around for another shell, it just sits there and waits. And then one by one, these other hermit crabs come along and they all line up in order of size. And then when the missing hermit crab comes, they all move up a shell simultaneously, really quickly, so they don't get baked by the sun. And these kind of things, we can look at these amazingly inspirational processes that happen in nature to inform how we, how we design our human world. And then we can look at ecosystem level solutions, which, I mean, people always say nature has no waste um, and has circular material loops, and in a mature ecosystem that's pretty true. And so we can look at ecosystems to, to learn from it. And as we well know, in an ecosystem it's not isolated, self-sustaining, zero energy, zero waste going on in one isolated organism. Different players in the ecosystem have many different roles, from primary producers to decomposers, to the beavers, which are ecosystem engineers, to the wolves, which if anybody's seen another great video, how, how wolves change rivers, you need those top predators to keep the herbivores down, to keep your um, growth at the riverbanks. Um, so it's an all an interconnected collaborative system. But it doesn't start like that. Our final um, biomimicry immersion was in the big island of Hawaii, whereas you probably all know it's erupting right now, but the island was made of different volcanoes and they erupted at different times. So it was a great time to see, place to see ecosystem succession. And there, this is maybe 30, 40 years ago, the flow, um, and you see it takes a while for the first organisms to come in. And those first organisms, they don't have circular flows, they plunder and lay waste, take all the energy they can, the water runs straight through, they find little cracks and places that they can begin to grow, and then as they grow, it provides nourishment and holds water so bigger um, shrubs can grow. These are actually the ahia trees, which can grow shrub size or can grow full size and make a forest. And it's only when we get to this mature ecosystem where we have these beautiful tree ferns and, and and different organisms that the flows get circular. So they don't start circular. It's only when we get to that um, mature ecosystem that both energy, water, and materials are in this circular process. So we looked at what is it that helps um, an ecosystem change from its linear model to a circular model, and is that something we can mimic in our human design systems? 
And so there's a lot of literature that talks about the characteristics of type 1 versus type 3 ecosystems. And here in green, I've just highlighted a few that I'm going to, to, to show you how that um, could be applied. So one of my favorite organisms in this, um, in this biome are the spring ephemerals. Um, they've just been flowering now from the blood roots and the trout lilies. And they take advantage of a narrow niche, a very narrow niche of um, this window when it's warm enough, but the trees haven't leafed out. So they can take the, the available sun on the forest floor and grow. And these skunk cabbages take advantage of an even narrower niche right at the beginning. They actually can give off heat to melt snow to come up to take advantage of that narrow window where they can get all the sun because the leaves haven't come out on the trees. And that to me is analogous to um, a startup like Spacious or Kettle Space, which instead of constructing a co-working space, notice that restaurants, many of them tend to be open in the day, I mean closed in the day, and we could use that space, provide Wi-Fi, free coffee, and charge people to a minimal amount to use it as a co-working space. So that's that development of niche specialization, of narrow niches, so that you can find an opportunity, and that becomes more narrow as ecosystems develop. Similarly, feedback loops are something that gets more and more developed as ecosystems develop. And so this on the left are the leafcutter ants, which have to go collect um, bits of leaves to feed the fungal garden. And they have to optimize their collective rate of flow. So it's not optimizing for the individual, it's optimizing for the colony. And they do that by taking note of the flow of incoming ants to the colony. And depending how dense the traffic is, they cut the leaves to a different size because they don't want to have that truck driver that slows down all the traffic behind them. So if there's a lot of traffic, they cut small leaves so they can keep moving fast. But if there's not a lot of traffic, they can cut much bigger leaves because they're not going to hold anybody up behind. So they regulate that depending on the feedback they're getting from the ants coming back to the, to, to the colony. And similarly, we saw on the right, here's Etsy and its amazing waste station at the bottom. It's, Etsy's a zero waste business. And they measure the waste that comes out of that waste station using that tablet at the top. And then they display the diversion rate they had last week. So everybody who works there knows how much they're diverting. And that kind of feedback loop generates everybody trying harder for the collective good. And then similarly, um, cycling of nutrients like the leaves on the forest floor. BK Rot is an organization in Brooklyn that picks up um, organic waste from restaurants and um, buy bike using local labor that's underemployed. And then it takes um, empty lots and converts them to community gardens using that compost. And then it sells some back as well. So we can kind of look at a larger scale. If we could develop these things with policy or whatever in the city, with um, grants, we can um, help our material flow system go towards circular. And I'm going to end with an illustration of a project that talks about um, this idea. Michael Paulin, um, another architect who loves biomimicry, talks about this on a video you can find online. And it started with a system which was work rehabilitation for recovering heroin addicts. They got paid to take cardboard from restaurants and shred it and deliver it to horse farms to use for bedding. And then they got paid to pick up that waste and they took it to a compost, to a worm farm where um, it was composted. They then had this idea to develop a caviar fish farm um, and that produced caviar that was um, sold back to the restaurant. So it's kind of linking these different businesses. And that was the initial circular loop. And then the guy who organized this just reached out to more and more businesses and um, developments and made it more and more complicated as time went on. So then they found waste bread from restaurants that had maggots, and they fed that to the fish. They got found that they could grow watercress on the fish farm using the fish waste in aquaponics and sell that to the restaurants. They had another work rehabilitation project for returning veterans with PTSD. 
and they had them take sewage from the sewage plant and start an orchard and willow farm, and the coppice from the willow trees heated biomass that kept the fish warm and sold apples to the restaurant. So at the same time, they were thinking about waste in the material sense, but also waste in the human sense. These were underemployed people. And so if we can think of waste socially, environmentally, and involve the creativity of everybody, we can get to that circular system. And I'll just end with my favorite quote from um, Robin Wall Kimra, a book called Braiding Sweetgrass, who says that she's talking about lichen and how an alga and fungus don't collaborate to form lichen in a Petri dish. But she says, if you take the ideal conditions away from them, then they collaborate. So her quote is, in a world of scarcity, collaboration and mutual aid become critical to survival. So say the lichens. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Right on time. <laughs> so next we have Audrey Kirk from the Post Landfill Action Network plan. And she's going to talk to us about modeling scalable zero waste. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Audrey. I'm the director of partnerships with PLAN, which stands for the Post Landfill Action Network. Um, so a quick introduction, a little anatomy of PLAN. So uh, PLAN works to uh, cultivate, educate, and inspire the student-led zero waste movement. Uh, we work with campuses across the country on zero waste projects of all flavors, everything from compost to repair spaces. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that um, during this presentation. Um, but real quick, let me give you some history of PLAN. Um, we were founded following a student project at the University of New Hampshire to deal with move-out waste. Uh, so if you've ever interacted with a campus in the springtime, you may know that students leave tons of perfectly usable dorm items behind when they move out of campus in the spring. Um, everything from furniture to electronics, school supplies, clothing, all of it. Um, and on many campuses, there's no system to deal with this. So uh, this student group at University of New Hampshire started a program to collect that stuff, clean it, sort it, store it over the summer, and then sell it at crazy reduced prices to students uh, in the fall as they're, as they're moving back in and buying those very same items. So uh, this project has reduced massive amounts of waste and uh, also saved uh, students and their families money and represents a, a replicable, scalable solution to a campus waste problem. So following the success of this project, our, um, our founder started a, uh, a nonprofit, essentially working to connect the dots between campuses who have um, solutions to many, many different types of waste streams. So PLAN's goal is to support those student leaders through movement building, connecting those campuses, through project support, answering the sort of sharing the best practices that campuses have, um, have developed with each other, and also supporting student leaders and giving them the skills to really be successful at achieving the things they're passionate about. So um, let me talk a little bit about why we've chosen this particular avenue to focus on zero waste. So why campuses? Um, First of all, I, I just want to say that we're going to focus right now as campuses as sort of an internal system, right? If you imagine a campus with material flows through it, um, that's kind of how we're going to, how I'm going to talk about them today. But that is not to say that campuses are, are sort of separated from the communities in which they're placed. Um, Plan also works on sort of helping campuses to, to reach roots into those communities, um, and I'm also happy to talk about that. Um, later. So, why campuses? First, scale. Uh, campuses are, are a much bigger sort of industry and community in, uh, in the U.S. Than, than people often recognize. There are 16 million students on 5,300 campuses. Um, also, uh, students are sort of hitting a phase of their lives where they're developing the habits and the expectations that will shape their, the rest of their lives. So, it's a, it's a wonderful time to be working with, with folks. Um, as they uh, kind of grow into their own. Um, secondly, students are powerful. Uh, students have um, often an idealism, many ideas, and uh, like are, are have uh, radical solutions that um, 
that campus administrators might not be willing to take on. Students have the ability to take risks, the campus administrators with their, uh, their responsibilities and their um, need to support their families maybe won't be willing to do. Students are, are amazing at that. Um, also, students are the users of this campus system, right? They're, they have the opportunity to redesign it for themselves. Um, I also, one of PLAN's sort of goals in working with campuses is to provide the opportunity for cross-pollination across departments within campuses, across campuses um, between, like in a, in a community and between campuses and communities. Um, we often say that, that all of the solutions we need already exist. It's just a matter of, of spreading them across many, um, to, to the, the, the many possible implementations of those. And finally, and this is the, the major thing I want to talk about, campuses are microcosms. They, um, there's, they, in some ways, run like businesses, and other ways, they run like cities. But ultimately, they're kind of an ideal pilot space for community infrastructure redesign. They have the ability to, um, to create policies that a neighborhood, for example, would struggle to, to implement, um, and to, to manage their material flows in a really amazing way. So um, in order to frame the way that we talk about campus infrastructure, as well as the linear consumption economy, I want to use this graphic. So uh, this was developed by um, Plan's wonderful previous graphic designer. And it shows the linear consumption economy. This is something I'm sure we're all familiar with. We heard about it earlier today. Um, our linear consumption economy extracts resources, produces goods, ships them around the world, uses them often for a very short period of time, and then disposes of them in landfills or incinerators for eternity. Um, but the piece of this that we want to focus on, um, you'll see the linear consumption economy in red, but in blue, you'll see folks challenging that linear consumption economy at every point along this toxic exploitative system. Everything from resisting extraction to uh, redesigning products, creating reuse recovery systems, um, and reclaiming the land that, uh, that the, these systems are built on. So um, this, this uh, method of challenging the linear consumption economy um, is, is applicable on, on huge scales, on, on global scales, on city scales, uh, but it's also applicable on campus scales. So I want to talk about ways that, um, that we've seen campuses modeling challenge, challenges this, to this system. So the first is regulation. We've seen campuses ban styrofoam, ban um, microbeads, ban plastic water bottles, and also do these sort of self-analysis of audits to, um, to really see what, what waste is coming in and have the ability to, to manage the purchasing and the material flow um, to, uh, to prevent uh, more waste. The next is resources. A good example of this is zero waste event kits, where campuses will have available to students a, um, a set of reusable dishes, for example, that they can use for an event, a set of signage with re recycling and compost bins that they can use for events, um, or even like wash stations. Um, we do this at our conference, and uh, it's much like what we've seen today, um, for, for reusable dishes at, at events. Um, Reuse systems on campuses, such as thrift stores or free stores that, that help recycle uh, materials within a community. Um, that's especially applicable to things like school supplies. Another type of reuse, uh, like infrastructures, for reusing things like to-go boxes instead of having disposable paper or, or styrofoam ones, um, as well as for reusable coffee cups, that sort of thing. Um, creating opportunities for repair on campus, and, on campus, including repair spaces or maker spaces, which I want to say can go beyond just 3D printing things, as, <laughs> which is often what we think about in maker spaces. But that's, it's an opportunity to have, to pull resources together and really um, repair and create there. Um, campuses sh showcase recovery, um, especially in food. That includes um, Recovering and redistributing food, um, such as our friends at the Food Recovery Network do, as well as compost systems. I also want to highlight this, um, this vending machine, which looks like a regular vending machine, but it's actually leftover food um, at the College of Atlantic, pa packaged into reusable containers and um, left in this vending machine for students to eat late at night after the dining halls are closed. Um, uh, and, and finally, 
recovery. So this kind of circles back to uh, the project that I started this presentation with, dealing with move out waste. It also applies to uh, recovering things from, um, from procurement, such as surplus stores. So all of these types of, um, types of solutions we've seen happen on campuses. They can happen on more campuses. And they also provide ideas and best practices for how to implement them on a city level. Uh, so finally, I just want to say for any students in the audience or the student in your life, um, let us know what, what your needs are. What projects are you working on? What inspires you? What do you need to be educated about? Um, plan can help. Uh, and I'll pass it along. Thank you, Audrey. So next we have Sandra Goldmark from Fix Up, who's going to be talking about reinventing repair for the circular economy. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am the founder of Fix Up, which is a social enterprise that is rethinking repair for the circular economy. I'm also the director of sustainability at Barnard College and a big fan of Plan for that reason. And, um, and originally, I started my career as a designer, which uh, in some ways meant that I spent years and years and years making stuff, buying stuff, schlepping stuff around the city, just generally fighting and dealing with all of the incredibly huge amounts of stuff in all of our lives. And that's, um, that's one of the reasons I started thinking about repair and thinking about ways to make it possible. So uh, I'm going to start again with this linear model we're all familiar with. Thank you, Annie Leonard. Um, and point out that at this point in this kind of very familiar graphic, repair isn't even there. It almost doesn't even exist on the map. Um, here is a more advanced map, perhaps. This kind of beautiful diagram is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this one. And this is, um, as you know, proposing a model where uh, to create a circular economy, we look at design, we look at end of pipe, and we look at extending product lifespan. So that's where repair comes in. There it is, yay, it's finally back on the map. <laughs> but of course, the problem is that repair is a crucial part of this kind of aspirational circular economy model. But on the ground, the reality is that repair is lagging behind um, lots of other parts of this system. Um, it's lagging way behind reuse and recycling, for example, the other, two of the other important Rs. Um, so I wanted to talk about why it's lagging and what we can do about it. So this is my map of repair and the modern economy of consumption. Um, so basically, you get a lot of stuff, right? You buy it, you buy it in the store, you buy it on Amazon, you get gifts from well-meaning relatives, it comes in under the crack under your door, I don't know, right? It gets into your house somehow, no matter what. Somehow you develop some component, some segment of this stuff that you actually like and you use it and you want to keep it. The other stuff goes into closets or God knows where, right? Hopefully into a reuse system. Then that stuff breaks, some of the stuff you actually like and want to keep using. So what are your options in the modern economy? You can fix it yourself if you have lots of time and space and tools, which I don't know many New Yorkers or frankly, people at all who have all of those in abundance. You can hunt far and wide for a local repair service provider. Again, these are a rare breed and increasingly rare. You can look through lengthy warranties and search the pages and contact manufacturers and spend hours on hold for each individual item that needs to be fixed if you have time for that kind of thing. But the reality is that often it finds its way into your closet, it sits, it collects dust, this nice broken item that you actually kind of would like to keep, and ultimately it goes to landfill. So right now, by and large, repair as a system in our society isn't working. And there's a lot of barriers, I'm just going to focus on a few of them. The number one barrier, of course, is that new stuff is cheap, right? This is the obvious one, but we have to point it out. Um, Another really important problem has to do with what I call um, the five errand problem. So this is, you're in your house, you, you have your little corner or closet of broken things, and let's say there's five different things that are broken. A lamp, a chair, your backpack, um, a toy, and your blender, whatever. Whatever your five things are. 
Right now, today, if you can even find somebody to fix those things, that represents five different errands. So that's a deal breaker. It's a deal breaker for me. It's a deal breaker for most people that I know. We, nobody has time to run five separate errands to get five different things fixed. It's a really basic, fundamental thing, but what I think it exposes is the real crux of the problem with repair today, is that it's an antiquated model that is structured from the point of view of the service provider and the manufacturer, not from the point of view of the user, the customer, of you, right? And this is where, um, it crunches everybody. It crunches you. You can't find a place to get your stuff fixed. It crunches the service provider who can't pay rent, who can't afford labor costs anymore because they're only accepting a narrow stream of stuff. And it doesn't, you know, narrow stream, I mean your specialized field of jewelry, um, appliances, bikes, whatever it is you do. You can't pay your rent and pay all your staff with just that narrow stream. And it doesn't provide any incentive for manufacturers or retailers or anybody else to get in on the game. So that's the old cycle that we're locked into. Um, and what I wanted to share a little bit about from Fix Up is we have been experimenting basically with building a new model for repair. Um, it's really simple in a lot of ways. We provide convenient drop-off locations for all kinds of broken things. So near your house, within your normal cycle of weekend routines or errand routines, we provide a place where you can drop off a huge range of broken items. So all those five errands, you just bring them to one place. Uh, we hire local artisans, we create local jobs, we pay our fixers and we charge our customers for repair. And we uh, are basically trying to create an ecosystem where people can get things fixed easily, conveniently, accessibly. Um, it may seem like uh, kind of an impossible task in the face of that other big barrier that I pointed out, which is the cheap cost of new goods. But one of the really exciting things that we've discovered in the process of building Fix Up is that people love their stuff. And this cannot be understated or overstated, excuse me. People have things, they like them, and they actually want to keep them. And they're willing to pay for it. The problem right now is that we don't have any systems to support them in doing that. We make the barriers too high. So what do they bring us? Uh, at Fix Up, they bring us all kinds of stuff. It breaks down into a few predictable categories, small appliances, furniture, Jewelry, lamps are their own separate item. We get a lot of lamps. Um, clothing, decor, toys, other miscellany. The key here is that, again, from the customer's point of view, once something is in your house, you don't really care who made it or where you bought it. You don't really want to keep the receipt. You don't really want to deal with it. It's all actually just in a category of your stuff and you want it to work. Um, the benefit it, of repair goes beyond the individual customer. Great, you get to keep your vacuum or your lamp. There's also the environmental benefit of reducing waste to landfill, but more importantly, reducing the need to make a new vacuum upstream. That's the real environmental benefit of repair, and it's really key. And then, of course, there's a social benefit. Uh, repair represents local labor, good jobs, uh, skilled, but not incredibly skilled. It's teachable, it's learnable, and it's the kind of work that, that can be done and can create jobs right here in New York, or other cities. <laughs> so, um, one of the interesting things about repair, so we've been doing this now for um, about five years. We've done 12 pop-ups in three boroughs. We've expanded. We've done thousands of items in New York and diverted over 10,000 pounds from landfill. Awesome, we're very proud of that and we're very excited. But when you consider some of the bigger systems out there, that may seem like small potatoes. But one of the things that I think is also um, really exciting to think about is how repair could actually begin to truly change those bigger systems. Because as I said, it's learnable, it's doable, it's replicable. And when a big player like Ikea or Target or any other manufacturer or retailer begins to think about and work on repair, they're actually beginning to do more than what I call operational efforts, like 
uh, renewable energy, which IKEA is doing, uh, greener uh, renewable materials in their products. Those are good and important, but they actually are fundamentally supporting the business model as is, right? Make more stuff, sell more stuff, but make it better. When you start thinking about repair, you actually are generating a revenue stream that is um, different. It's a different business model, and it represents a change in the fundamental structure of the system, and one that big players can tap into. And I'm just going to point out that IKEA, I picked them on purpose. They wrote the book on disposable home goods, right? <laughs> but they are actually beginning to talk about and work on repair, reuse, um, repairability, and design. There's a lot of baby steps and really exciting ones happening. So basically, um, I just wanted to leave you with the idea of the power of repair to change the bigger systems, the power of repair to create a healthier individual relationship with your stuff, um, the power to create healthy local economies, and to become a really important part of this circular model that we're talking about today. Basically, in short, it works, people love it, and um, I can't wait to see where this all goes. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And now we're going to have a representation by Nicole Bouchard, if I'm saying your name correctly, from the University of Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to present a, a hypothetical design proposal that I did um, as part of a design competition that asked designers to rethink 42nd Street here in New York City. Um, and so the, the, the project is um, meant to kind of ask what if, what happens when we reuse um, lots of the kind of urban waste products around us. Um, it's quite idealistic and fantastical, but again, I think it's important questions that we should be asking and contemplating. So. Um, for thousands of years, humans have experimented with various methods of waste disposal, from burning to burying to simply packing up and moving in search of, un of an uns unscathed environment. Habits of disposal are deeply ingrained in our daily lives, so casual and continual that we rarely ever stop to ponder the big picture effects on social, spatial, and ecological orders. Rethinking the ways in which we produce, collect, discard, and reuse our waste, whether it's materials, spaces, or places, is essential to ensure more feasible futures. So uh, this, this project went wild, asking the question, what happens when we work with urban waste to create wonder? So in 2008, for the first time in history, more than half of the world's population was concentrated in urban centers. Population in urban areas is projected to increase from 3.6 billion in 2011 to 6.3 billion in 2050. Megacities defined as cities with more than 10 million people are on the rise. In 1970, the world had two megacities, Tokyo and New York City here, but today there are 23. Metropolises like New York City are bursting at the seams with an average of 10,000 to 30,000 people per square mile. As a result, our cities are producing alarming amounts of wastewater, a surplus of sludge, and absurd sums of food scraps. The effects of population pressures compounded with environmental issues regarding natural disasters, groundwater quality, escalating energy costs and soaring food prices would suggest the urgent need to reconsider more efficient and productive forms of urbanism. To do this, reconceptualizing our approach to urban waste is essential. So New York City is the largest city in the US, as we all know, and one of the most populous metropolitan regions in the world, with a population of 8.5 million that covers an area of over 300 square miles. Inherently, a city of this scale and magnitude is bound to produce excessive amounts of waste, but the question is, what are these waste products and how might they be used to produce more efficient and environmentally conscious forms of urbanism? A closer look at New York City's waste production reveals this exciting opportunities for fantastically pragmatic futures. So Wet n Wild is an urban design project that proposes to catalog and collect urban waste products to create a squishy landscape that is resourceful, recreational, and resilient along New York City's 42nd Street. This soft landscape would slow stormwater runoff, manage excess rainwater, revive native ecologies, and provide coastal defense for future natural disasters. The Union of Concerned Scientists, an advocacy group organization that conducts and communicates climate change-related research, recently published a report that states, while today in the United States there are about 90 communities that face, cro that face chronic inundation, that number could reach nearly 700 by the year 2010. In the scientists' most extreme sea level rise scenario, 60% of the East Coast and Gulf Coast towns will be chronically inundated by 2100. 
including most of New York City. On a globally average basis, a sea level, the sea level has risen about eight inches since 1880. And for these reasons, wet and wild design approaches are necessary to contemplate and consider as designers. So this project looks at a variety of different urban waste products at a very large um, kind of landscape urbanism scale, um, the first being soil. So New York City is surrounded by ports on the Hudson, Hackensack, and Pasiak rivers. Every year, approximately three million cubic yards of silt are collected from these water bodies in an effort to facilitate the flow of boats. The majority of this material is sand and mud, with a lesser portion being clay, rock, and glacial fill. In 2016, the $2.1 billion Main Navigation Channel Deepening Program was completed, a project by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey that dredged the Ambrose, Anchorage, Arthur Kill, Kilvin Cull, and Port Jersey channels. In total, the project removed 53 million cubic yards of material. In addition, an abundance of soils excavated annually during the construction process of New York City's many building projects. Using a cut and fill landscape strategy, Wet n Wild proposes to distribute, to redistribute this reusable, the reusable portions of this earthen material along 42nd Street to create an undulating topography that collects and choreographs the movement of water, promotes physical activity, and allows for urban agricultural production. And so the waste product uh, number two, looking at water, Every day, roughly 13 million gallons of water are removed from New York City's 842 miles of subway tracks. 748 pumps located throughout the city's 309 pump stations direct this wastewater into manholes which then empty into New York City's waterways. Simultaneously, abundant amounts of wastewater enter New York City's soil system and riverways in the wake of severe rainstorms, rain and snowstorms. Additionally, impressive amounts of wastewater are produced in the form of condensation from the HVAC systems of New York City's skyscrapers during the warm weather months. So Wet n Wild proposes to collect and reuse this wastewater along the length of 42nd Street, and using gravity-fed purification processes that line the undulating artificial topography, brown water would become blue water. These constructed remediation waterways would provide a productive and pleasant landscape from river to river that could purify polluted water before returning it to the earth. Waste flow number three, looking at snow. So New York City has 20,000 miles of streets and 1,250 miles of highways that move 1.1 million vehicles in and out of the city on a daily basis. During the winter months, 1,335 plow truck vehicles move snow in and out of the city, um, collecting snow and then disposing it in snow yards where it's then left to melt into the city soil. So Wet n Wild would propose to make use of this urban snow supply by using it as thermal insulation during the cold winter months and as additional remediated, remediated water supply once it has melted with the warm spring winds. Waste uh, flow number four, looking at sewer and sludge. So New York City has 14 wastewater treatment plants, 100 pumping stations, and 6,600 miles of sewer pipes that process 1.3 billion gallons of sewage each day. Currently, a portion of New York City's biosolids are disposed of in landfills in New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, while the remaining portion undergoes lime stabilization processes in Pennsylvania and Colorado facilities. Went Wild proposes that instead of exporting biosolids to out-of-state locations, that, it use, uh, that, that, that these biosolids be used locally to fertilize the fabricated landscape across 42nd Street creating points for public recreation, community gardens, and municipal nurseries that could then give back to the city. Waste flow five, looking at compost. So New York City residents dispose of nearly 20,000 tons of autumn leaves and 100,000 Christmas trees per year. In addition, an abundance of food waste um, is produced and collected by many of the existing New York City composting programs, like BK Roth that Claire mentioned earlier. Wet n Wild proposes to tap into this existing uh, uh, composting programs to make use of this material locally, both as a soil supplement and as a heat source. During the winter months, when the compost is abundant, it would provide hot spots along 42nd Street. And during the spring and summer months, when the demand uh, for heat has diminished, the compost would be distributed throughout the wet and wild food forests, flowering meadows, and plant plots. This resourceful urban landscape would provide uh, food and fuel to some of New York City's 8.5 million residents. And lastly, the, the final um, uh, waste uh, product, looking at compost again, but in this sense as a, as a kind of food producer. So currently New York City, uh, New York City imports a number of non-native fruits and vegetables 
um, including but not limited to avocados, bananas, Brazil nuts, cashews, citrus fruits, coconuts, dates, figs, pineapples, and plantains, many of which I walked by on my, my way here from the subway. Wet and Wilds uh, would provide a new ground with clean water and passive heat source from the compost process for these tropical fruits and vegetables to potentially be grown, eliminating unsustainable commercial agricultural practices and the massive carbon footprint of the importation process. So Wet and Wild would provide a wondrous terrain that promotes an extensive array of human activities from walking, running, biking, and playing to planting, growing, sharing, and collaborating. This reconceptualization of urban waste could produce a dynamic landscape of flexible systems, services, and resources to support and cultivate a more ecologically sensitive and resilient environment that is fertile and rich with the potential for production. As designers, it's our responsibility to place natural resources, ecosystems, and waste management at the center of our design approaches, regardless of the project's scale and context. Doing so will bring us only one step closer to decelerating the effects of climate change. Through this lens, the future is wet and full of resilient ecologies, robust economies, and fertile grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, all right, so we have uh, a few minutes, and I'm going to just ask one question that uh, hopefully all of the panelists can uh, take a few minutes, and then we'll have hopefully a little bit of time for audience questions as well. So I'm going to wrap two questions into one, which is basically the questions that were asked uh, in the first plenary today um, about the implications for social justice, and some of you talked about that in each of your presentations, and action items that you are most looking to prioritize or advocate for at the, uh, at, and share with us here in the audience. And we've, we've run the gamut here from 42nd Street to biomimicry systems, so we have a wide range of different types of perspectives uh, or approaches potentially that we can highlight. So maybe I'm gonna start from, from Claire and, and work, work our way out. Hi, I mean, I think on a biomimicry side of things, it's, it's thinking in terms of systems, in terms of the people as well as the materials. And um, I mean, we saw that through, throughout the presentations, but we, when I was doing the zero waste design guidelines, what I really saw is that when we visited buildings where the creativity of everybody had been involved, um, everybody in the system, there were porters who had like redesigned the organics bin in Stytown. Like, where everybody's voice is valuable and where you can make use of everybody's creativity, then the systems get stronger. So I think that, I mean, obviously waste, reducing waste helps with, in um, social justice issues, but also if your systems can use people creative, creatively and at their best and highest level, just like the circular economy asks for products to be reused at their highest level, that's how we can move forward. And I have to say, biomimicry, just at a personal level, is a really inspirational way to move forward. So to get people motivated to, to make change, just seeing that these things are possible in the natural world and appreciating how complex and elegant and beautiful they are can lead to further actions. Um, I mean, personally, I'm working with the AIA Committee on the Environment. I'm mm -hmm. the co-chair there, and that was where the Zero Waste Design Guidelines started. So I would love to try and work on policy things within the city to try and move. So move the guidelines yeah. forward. That's great. Thank you. Audrey. <laughs> sure. So I think one of the challenges that, um, that we have come up against as plan um, and this speaks to both questions, is that the zero waste movement in many communities is, is sort of seen as a lifestyle movement. Um, it's about reducing your personal waste, about purchasing in bulk, about recycling and composting, um, and, and that's valuable. I don't want to under, undervalue the, the kind of individual choices, but one of the things that, that we have been working with our kind of college audience to do is to, to zoom out, you know? And that's one of the reasons I'm really excited to be here today is because I, I think we've kind of bypassed the whole, um, the, those kinds of steps and are already zoomed out. But, um, but on college campuses, that's, that's kind of a process. There are steps to getting there. Um, so one of them is that, that plan has, one of the tools plan has developed to take those steps is, is the points of intervention um, framework that, uh, that you saw earlier. And I think one of the really important components of that, 
framework is not is not just to um, to kind of talk about the the flow of products, but also to show all of the many 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 ways that people are exploited and hurt by that system. Um, and so, I think sometimes. Uh, zero waste, especially the lifestyle capacity, can get separated from um, those, uh, the sort of social justice implications of the, the consumptive economy. And I think um, turning those conversations back to the affected communities is, um, is a big part of it. So um, I think that uh, our, so that, that's one of the major ways that Plans Work ties into, into social justice. Um, and it's also one of our, our major like action items right now is to kind of push the conversation beyond lifestyle, beyond just recycling and compost, and, and to, to think much, much bigger. Hey, thank you. Andra. So repair has an obvious, I think, social justice angle in that if you fix something, you're not manufacturing something new, and so therefore you're um, at least avoiding or alleviating some of the problems of excessive extraction and manufacture, right? But that all feels very jargony to me. And this, um, what I wanted to just talk about briefly here is the, the, one of the things that's been most important to me in this whole project since we started has to do with the value of the work. Like when you open up someone's nasty old blender and clean out the dead cockroaches and fix the damn thing and put it back together, and they pay you money for it, I think there's a really powerful statement being made there, that the work of human hands has value, that these skills and the ability to take care of the things that we have has value. And I want to emphasize it because I think it's a, a, a transaction and a skill that is historically undervalued in a big way in our society. Maintenance, cleaning, taking care of things. These are jobs that are traditionally done by women, by people of color, and they're underpaid historically, right? This is not what our society values. So for me, in repair, there's actually a little bit of a, of a um, kind of radical social statement of saying, I think our society can and should value this labor and the people doing it. And policy, um, it, like we're, you know, we're all, everybody in this room is sort of working to swim upstream. So I think, yeah, if I had a magic wand and there could be some policies that would, you know, support the kind of work I'm doing and everybody else is doing uh, in so many ways, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sweden, Sweden just um, did a tax rebate for repair services. Yeah, I like the tax rebate, I like that idea. <laughs> yeah, the sales tax is killing us. Good. <laughs> Um, yeah, in terms of uh, the social justice question, I guess I see the project that I presented as, you know, being cited in one of the one of the maybe a handful of moments in New York City where it really it, it is a public space that attracts people from all over the city, all over the country, all over the world, and so it's this moment where people of all ages, backgrounds, races, languages come together, beliefs, religions come together, um, and so trying to think about how design could ins potentially be this way that. Um, allows for these different interactions and, and, and conversations to happen between people of all types and walks of life. Um, and, and in terms of, um, I guess, like trying to give them a moment, like noting the food forest um, idea of the project as this way that uh, resources from the city typically seen as waste get transformed into wonder that aren't necessarily paid for, aren't hidden, aren't in the, the kind of wealthiest parts of the city, but are in this super public space um, and accessible to people of, of all walks of life. Um, and so just trying to think about that and about design in that way at this really large scale, but also at these much smaller scales, um, not only about design of landscapes, but objects and, and everything else that the panel has talked about. Great. Yeah. Um, all right, so we have a few minutes for um, audience questions, and I'm gonna have to use one of our microphones here to reach you, because I don't, I'm gonna do the labor myself here, <laughs> and start with the two here, yeah? I have a question for a fix-up. Have you thought about partnering with design schools and um, helping customers transform their old items to looking more modern and new as well? So instead of just repair, but also, because I know that's why a lot of things are thrown out is because it's the last year's design or, so just thinking about that. We, we answer them together. 
Uh, thank you, panel. I was curious about how education um, kind of plays within each of your own industries and what how you work that into kind of being able to explain your ideology more to people who you're working with. Um, I guess it kind of geared out of the fix up. I have some experience working within the world of sewing machine repairs. And so as I worked more and more with that, uh, the biggest thing for me is just, yeah, trying to figure out a way of educating people and kind of uh, giving value back to that idea of being hands on. Thanks. So um, we call it detailing or upgrades. And actually, a lot of the repairs we do, not a lot, but a fair number aren't actually repairs. There's like, can you make this bracelet into two earrings? Or can you, you know? So we haven't gotten, you know, we are just have dabbled in that. And we haven't partnered with design schools, but it would be interesting. I mean, one of my favorite products out there is the Fairphone, which is designed to be upgraded every year so people can get a little bit of that jazz of like, ooh, it's new to me. <laughs> um, and then for us, for education, before we move on to that, um, do you mean, there's, I think that we do, we work on two forms of education. One is educating the, the owner of the stuff, that the service exists, that you can fix things, like that, that it, you know, what the benefits are. And then just fixing people, teaching people to fix things is another big thing that we have done in a number of ways. Events in schools, like as young as, I went to a preschool once, um, and middle schools, they love it. Uh, and then we've been working really hard over the years at, at training fixers. And it's actually really interesting, because you know I'm a teacher. It's hard to teach, because you kind of have to do it. But we've sort of figured out a little system. It's, it's very old-fashioned kind of apprenticeship master craftsman you know, model, where if you're fixing next to somebody, that's, I think, the way to learn. And you give them things that to start out that they can't mess up too, too much. <laughs> Other thoughts on education, on the education piece of your work? Sure, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so education is a big thing that PLAN does, and I, I think we take three angles to this. Um, so one is uh, like leadership skills. Um, I spoke a little bit about, about that in our presentation, but um, we really try to use the work that we do as an avenue to, to really like equip students to, to make real change, and that applies both in their student lives and, and in their future. So that's, that's one component. Another uh, of, of our education has to do with kind of project-specific stuff. I mentioned best practices, that sort of thing. But the third and the thing that, that really excites me the most is um, what I call kind of our, our like philosophy series. So, so we um, do these both online and, and in person on campuses where we, we really dig into some aspect of um, the waste crisis. Like how do landfills and incinerators actually work? Like, like they're, they're so hidden from us. What do they mean to like, is zero waste actually possible under capitalism? Discuss. Um, and like all of these kind of really deep dives into really like deconstruct this system and think about why is it the way that it is? What are the breaking points? How like what's my role? What's my community's role? Um, and I, I think that uh, having those those conversations that are you know part education but also part um, like like just like group like noodling you know is um, is really like what what plan like a big role that plan plays yeah i can talk to the education question um i teach in the school of architecture and urban planning at the university of wisconsin milwaukee um and i'm a big believer in whenever i teach classes whether it's design studios or seminars and and bringing in outside organizations and groups to the classroom and getting the students also out into the city and to a, into a kind of productive uh collaborative relationship with these organizations so um we don't have fix up but i would say organizations like fix up um are, are somewhat similar um um, a couple of the ones that we've worked with recently are called uh, Waste Cap, and they deconstruct buildings in the city that are slated for demo demolition and um, basically salvage any of the reusable parts from these homes, whether it's furniture items or actual kind of building material, and stored in a warehouse. Um, and students, um, in many cases, they've donated the, the material to the students to then maybe th this goes to the question about like how do you integrate design into the kind of fix up model. Um, we've kind of started to dabble in that, and it's been really great. I think the students. Um, there's this really lovely kind of ownership, authorship, and, and like pride in their work that 
happens when I think they're working with people in this city, materials from the city, all of that stuff. We've also worked with um, Wood Anchor, which is a local organization that um, takes down uh, fallen trees or trees that need to come down due to disease, um, use that wood, that lumber material, mill it, and then, and then design. You know, it goes all the way from uh, designing and building houses to installations, um, to public art, uh, sculptures. Um, and, and so the, the, I just think that maybe as um, it's been implied here too, that you have to start young and the university student isn't necessarily as young as you can go, but I, I do think that it's our job and our responsibility as educators to kind of instill this, um, this mentality in students so that we are super conscious of how we're making things, what they're made of, what the like afterlife is of all of these objects and materials, but collaborating with other organizations like Plan and Fix Up and um, yeah, it's, it's important. Yeah, and as part of the development of the Zero Waste Design Guidelines, it was done through the AIA at the Center for Architecture. And so we've had an educational program um, running through the whole thing um, with sessions for architects. I'm going out to architects and developers and, and talking to them about how they can design buildings so that the occupants can use less materials and better separate waste within them. And then also there's going to be a big exhibition at the Center for Architecture running from June 14th through September 1st, which is for educating the public and also has K-12 education programs along with it, as well as a few symposiums for discussion of, um, we have people coming from Paris to talk, to talk about projects there and, and discuss with people here to see how we could change the way we design at both an urban scale and a building scale to get to zero waste. And then on the biomimicry side, Biomimicry NYC is going to start a quarterly lecture program to talk about how we can be inspired and apply biomimicry. And that'll be here in New York City. Yes. Great. So you can access it. And if you're here at the New School, we'll be offering a university-wide lecture on waste and justice. So if you're students, um, you can take that course and learn more about these, these topics as well here on campus. So I want to thank our panelists um, for their amazing presentation. <laughs>